Right. Okay. Jacqueline, welcome. Oh, thank you very much for having me. No, we're delighted. Your career is fascinating and, and extraordinary. You know, when, but when you were young, you weren't. Technology was not was not something that I think that you thought you would do. Right. I think you wanted to be a newsreader. Where did the spark come from to set you off on this path? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, who wouldn't want to be a newscaster well, on the BBC? <laughs> I mean, but the BBC didn't come knocking. Um, and I came back from my degree in Germany. I was the first in my family to go to university and I was excited to come back to London. Um, but I needed to pay the bills. And I was offered the opportunity to join a company in technology recruitment. So it was all about people, people and yeah. placing people into this new sector called tech. I had no idea what that was. My degree was in European business and languages. And so I took the opportunity. And after two years, I went to work for my largest client, a tech company. And I have never looked back since. So it's been a very exciting career. I've loved every minute of being in the technology yeah. sector. I mean, given that you, you didn't plan to get into it, when you're and now, you've got people hungry to enter the sector. What, what would you say to them about, you know, if you're a young person now, probably thinking about this, or maybe not, you know, thinking about what you're going to do, what's the advice you'd give to them about how best to prepare themselves? Virtually every job on the planet is going to have a tech element yeah, to well, it. Yeah, I completely agree, yeah. So when you think about it from that aspect, then isn't technology assets and skills, aren't they the ultimate portable? Um, every job is a technology job. Every right? job. And you don't have to be a deep technologist to be part of the tech sector. And that's where I would say, you know, look, come and have a look because we've got everything from, you know, creative, uh, design work. So we call it STEAM. Yes, um, with the extra science, A. Science, technology, right? yeah. engineering, arts and maths. Uh, and not just STEM, because there's so much creativity in our industry, as well as being the deep technologist. But it's all about, you know, you could exchange software engineer for problem solver. You right. Know? So, you know, I think we, we tend to wall ourselves up behind, you know, technology words. And that's a bit off-putting sometimes. So yeah. we, sh we should humanise our language. Yeah, it's actually much more inclusive than people might, yeah. might think in that sense. But that said, there is something special and distinctive about the culture I think you find in certainly high technology growing yeah. companies. Yeah. You know, what is that? What is it that, that that's the kind of magic of it that, that you found? It doesn't matter that you don't get to be a Bill Gates or someone like that, but you can go on your own journey, which can be very extensive, very exciting, and, and really make a difference. I mean, there's so much impact technology out there, which is making you know, social differences. And you don't have to be a massive player to make a massive difference. And I think that's where democratization of technology is really interesting. And also with this you know, green industrial revolution mm. and climate change context, you know, there is so much that we can learn from the younger generation and how they can use their creativity to solve some of the world's biggest problems. Yeah. One thing that we've done a lot actually in some of these sessions before, we talk about apprenticeships. Yeah. And I think one of the great things that has happened is people are increasingly seeing apprenticeships as a fantastic high quality route, right? That not everyone it needs to go to university. There's this alternative out there which is incredibly good for them and works. Uh, and then the, then the next bit is changing people's perception okay, it's not just for particular types of jobs because they have in their head of oh, apprenticeship in the old days meant you this type of industry. And we've seen now, whether it's Microsoft, whether it's smaller businesses, or using the apprenticeship route to bring young people into the yeah. industry. Yeah. And have, you, have you found that that's changed over time? The dynamic that's helping is that we need skills really fast. And when you put that dynamic together with traineeships, and apprenticeships, what you find is that you get people who can learn and also start to contribute to industry much faster, faster. than yeah. if they were going through the traditional university route. So, you know, we are all about widening pathways and getting more people into the skills pool because that's going to be our biggest challenge. And where we need to build competitive advantage is in the skills base. Is the challenge getting very young people, whether they're primary school or secondary school to study STEM subjects? Or is the challenge actually a bit later on getting people to, to think about careers in this industry? If we were building a football team for 
the country. We'd probably be scouting for talent at what, age six, seven, eight? But in tech, we expect people to rock up fully formed at 16 plus. Right. And, you know, frankly, I think we need to drive it harder, much younger through the influencers, which are the teachers, yeah. the parents. We need to make sure that we've got STEM, STEAM subjects right across the age group where they start to get excited and interested in, you know, subjects, I think at age four plus, I yeah. would say, let's go young. But I do think that we need to teach them critical thinking, problem solving, and Adam, get into and excited and about STEM. Science. And I think the key is excitement. And I, so I spent some time with my wife focusing on this when we were living abroad and trying to get more people into STEM. And it was interesting, the research there at the time was exactly as you said, that if you haven't got kids engaged in it, probably before they hit 10, right, yeah. at some point around that kind of age, yeah. you, then you're not going to be able to get them in at 16, 18 to, yeah. to embrace it. So your, your window of opportunity is probably uh, is much earlier than I had imagined it would be. Yeah. And the key was excitement. We piloted essentially after school science clubs with really interesting material from a, a science museum that specializes in it. That's what it took, right? You could see the kids come through and it, you could see the unlocking happen. You know, you talk about after school clubs as well, but you know, I am an ambassador for the Girl Guiding Association. Yes. And there are 500,000 girls in this country in either the sort of brownies, right up to Girl Guides ranges. And when you take that group and think, I could inspire them all into STEM or STEAM subjects, that's where industry is coming alive to fund badges and so it starts with consent online, so stay safe so, online, yep. which is so cool at that age. And then it goes right up to AI and robotics and everything in between. So we're encouraging industry and all our Tech UK members, for example, to fund these badges and make sure that girls have access yeah. to them. So well, it's very exciting. I, as, as dad of two young girls, I, I know about it and it's fantastic. Yeah. And uh, no, I think it's, it's, a great, it's a great thing. Obviously, we've got, you've got to make it interesting for girls at that young age. When you think about later on in their careers, what, what are the barriers that, are the, that we need to break? Yeah, for, for women coming into the industry or returning to the industry, you know, clearly there is some mentoring that needs to happen. I think some sponsorship yeah. to get women into industry. We've got to solve the, the gender pay gap, clearly. Um, and I think, you know, it's also about demystifying technology. You know, I like to think of women as the ultimate problem solvers. And right. you know, we wear so many hats. <laughs> and you know, and I do think that, that we are pretty well predisposed to making a massive difference in tech because of those intrinsic skills. Now, you mentioned Tech UK, which is again, one of your many hats. You know, we, we work with, with you guys uh, when we were designing our Help to Grow Digital yes. program for yes. budget. And I think you, the organization has spoken a lot about, actually, you know, we, we, we represent all these technology people, this great, we're coming up with all this great software, but what we need is all these people who, who don't necessarily think about themselves as technology businesses to realize how important and powerful that technology can be to improving their businesses. How have you seen that evolve? Because it's something that in the UK has been a struggle for, for a while. Yeah, I, I think when you incentivize businesses, especially small businesses, who arguably create something like 66% of all jobs in this country, yep. right? So, you know, when you think about their opportunity not to be a technology specialist, but to avail themselves of services, cloud-based services, mm -hmm. like the financial accounting yep. and so on that's in that help to grow package, you think, wow, okay, well, we can really unlock them from the misery of having to buy a computer, figure it out for themselves. And, and, and actually, you know, when they are cloud-based, they are free to focus on customers, they're free to focus on the business that they're in. And we've seen something like 70% increase in confidence yes. in using technology actually since the pandemic, pandemic started. Yeah. So that's very exciting. When you take a step back and then think about the UK in general, and our economic growth going forward. We talked about AI and you know, a couple of other areas. On the technology side, are there other areas that, that stick out to you as, as areas where we just have a global competitive advantage that we must 
continue to, to nurture and enhance. I mean, fintech is an area that obviously with my job I see firsthand, yeah. which I think would yeah. fit that category. But Yeah, fintech for sure. I think we've seen through the pandemic that health tech, I mean, wow, that's yeah. really taken off. The fact that you could now have a doctor's appointment um, like that. online, yeah. you know, and, and, and just get the advice that you need straight away without necessarily going into a, a doctor's surgery, you know, just wow. Um, and I think all of the health tech around, you know, the vaccine process, uh, I, I actually have been really astonished by what's been um, created and innovated. I've heard you talk about your childhood and growing up, and then you've talked about leadership, and leadership, in your case, a lot of it coming from the resilience that you build and overcoming challenges. I mean, I think your personal story is inspiring, and it's, uh, and it's amazing what you've accomplished. Um, especially in the context of what you faced growing up. What are the lessons that you've taken away and what are the things that have helped you as you've been driving forward? Yeah, well, I mean, I have an enormous fear of failure um, as a result of <laughs> growing up, um, but I'm open about that. And, and actually, you know, what I, what I think I've learned is that there's no such thing as failure, not really. There's only successful learning. <laughs> and, and as Great. a leader, you know, what that teaches me is to, is to experiment a bit, right. especially, I think, when uh, situations are ambiguous. And as we move forward out of this pandemic, our leaders are going to have to operate in an ambiguous and uncertain environment. And I think we will have to learn how to experiment a bit, fail fast, um, come back stronger, but learn those lessons. And do you think culturally, as a country, I mean, you've worked, you know, you've seen things all around the world. We, we've changed culturally here about how we you know, embrace the fact that people try things they don't work and then you try something else and that's not a bad thing, that's a good thing. I mean, I, but I think there's probably still work to do on that, whether it's at an individual level or a level of society. Yeah, I think there is. I mean, we need to create an environment and culture here where failing is okay. It's part of the process. It's part of the process. You know, when you look at Israel, for example, in their tech hubs, they won't invest in any founder yeah, unless yeah. they failed two or three times. Yeah, and that's quite interesting, isn't yeah. it, culturally? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's the same, the same in Silicon Valley as well. Yeah. This, this mentality, it's not, it's not a problem to have no. started something that didn't work out and you move on to yeah. the next one. Yeah, it, so we uh, have to nurture those moments of learning yeah. uh, and, and maybe reframe the language around that. Well, look, it's been, a, it's been absolutely brilliant to talk to you. Thanks for making the time for us. As I said, your, your story is an inspiring story for many, not just girls, but for, for all of us. And the Thank things you. you're doing are making an enormous difference. And you know, we've enjoyed working with you and all your members. And I think there's lots more we can do together. Certainly is. Take care. Thank you.